Hey guys, it's Adam from Loose Pixel. I want to jump straight into today's video because it's probably one of the most important things I'm ever going to talk about on my channel. A Senate hearing uh, that addresses artists' rights with regards to artificial intelligence. A, a subject which I have covered multiple times on my channel. I've had large podcasts with multiple members, m multiple authorities uh, in the domain of art today, which you can check out on my channel. Uh, multiple videos where I share my personal feelings and my evolving feelings as, as the months and now years have passed. Um, and this hearing finally gets the ball rolling on our rights, on the laws, on what's ethical and what's unethical. In my opinion, a, a little bit too late because the cat's already out of the bag, so to speak, but um, better late than ever. Um, the reason I want to break this down into multiple pieces is because today I just want to focus on one particular facet of it, the opening statements of all of the people involved, which is substantial in and of itself because there's five opening statements representing different aspects of this of this conversation. Um, but I want to put particular focus on this and the people involved and what their best interests are because that's going to help you to focus on truths or mistruths moving forward through the rest of this hearing, which we'll address uh, in a later video. Okay, hopefully we'll do these back to back. So we're going to start by just introducing the people uh, involved. I've done a little bit of back research into the into the individuals who are involved, some of which some of whom I know personally, and uh, then we'll listen to the opening statement. So. Swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give before Okay. I can't help but smile. <laughs> I get emotional because there's somebody I care about in this in this lineup over here. Um, not the first. Okay, so we're gonna start from left to right. We've got Ben Brooks, Mr. Dana Rao, Professor Professor Matthew Sag, Carla Ortiz, and Jeffrey Harleston. By the way, through this entire hearing, you never see Jeffrey's last name. It's always cut off, no matter at what point in the video I looked for it. Uh, so starting at the left with Ben Brooks, uh, Ben Brooks is essentially a business guy. I have his LinkedIn profile over here, but essentially he is the head of public policy at Stability AI. Uh, Stability AI being the company that produced St uh, Stable Diffusion. And let's have a look at his particular background. So he's a young guy, he's a young business guy. Basically places he's worked at in the, po in the past is Coinbase, developing a credible and post-hype case for digital asset technology against the complex backdrop, uh, backdrop of decentralized finance, sanctions, enforcement, and evolving securities law. He worked at Google X. He worked on Wing for Google X, scaling the world's most advanced drone delivery service on three continents. And Uber, driving swift, fair, and durable regulation of blah, 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 blah. Okay, and his, his, his subsequent experience, policy development and expansion lead, Uber, uh, research assistant, etc., etc. He's his education includes a bachelor of laws and a bachelor of arts, uh, not to be confused with fine arts, of course. Um, so basically, he is a business guy with a law and business background. I want to put emphasis on this moving forward because these are things that I'm going to be pausing on and addressing as he gives his opening statement. The next person is Dana Rao, and Dana Rao represents Adobe. And him specifically, uh, he's 50 years old, so he's actually close to my age. Uh, he's been the executive vice president and general counsel at uh, and corporate secretary of Adobe since 2018. Okay, Adobe, of course, if you're an artist uh, of any kind, you're familiar with Adobe. Whether you do if you do film production, then you're familiar with Adobe Premiere or After Effects. If you're into photography, then you know Photoshop and Lightroom. If you work in in, in audio and music, you've probably worked in Audition or something of the likes. They are the biggest company with regards to digital art and production on the planet. So um, he's representing what would basically be the bridge between tech and art. And they themselves, Adobe implemented and released uh, their own uh, use of um, Stability AI, which is called Adobe Firefly, which is now being released to the public in, I was using the original beta before it, but now it's being released to the public. He's got a very, very important role in this whole argument, okay? Um, and he's somebody whose testimony I'm paying very close attention to based off of his very, very important position in this conversation. 
Next to him is Professor, Professor Matthew Sag, and Professor Matthew Sag is a professor of law, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science at Emory University Law School. Sag is an expert in copyright law and intellectual property. So he, you can see, is kind of standing in the middle of everybody over here. He uh, has a very, very important uh, role to play over here because his, his profession, his focus is basically bridging the gap between technology and law and ethics. Following him is somebody, again, <laughs> who, who I'm very, very proud to have at this panel. The fact, that, the fact that she's standing at this panel looking as badass as ever in her power black outfit right there um, is because she's, she's somebody I've known in the industry and if you, you've been in art for any length of time, she's, she's a legend in the artistic community, but also somebody who I know to be an incredibly warm-hearted, very, very intelligent, very talented person. Carla is an award-winning artist who enjoys working on a diverse and wide variety of projects. As a concept artist with over 10 years of professional experience, Carla has worked uh, for Paragon Studios, NCSoft, Ubisoft, Kabam, Industrial Light and Magic, Marvel Films, Universal Studios, and HBO. As a professional illustrator, her clients include Wizards of the Coast, Ace Books, Tor Books, Orbit Books, CBP, and has provided cover work uh, and art for various independent authors and toy makers. As a fine artist, her work has been shown in the Studio, Gal uh, studio Gallery in San Francisco, uh, the Safe House Studio Shows, Think Space Art Gallery, Nucleus Gallery, uh, Spoke Art Gallery, Hashimoto Contemporary, and International Gallery, um, Art Ludique in, is it Art Ludique? Oh no, Art Ludique in Paris, France. And most importantly, Carla loves good music, good stories, good laughs, and good food. She paints her days away with her cat, Kitty Batty. And that's how she likes it. I had to throw that in because, of course, she's a cat person. God love her. God love her. So, last but not least is Jeffrey Harleston. He represents the musical side of the artistic, uh, artistic argument. And Jeffrey Harleston is General Counsel and Executive Vice President of Business and Legal Affairs for Santa Monica, California-based Universal Music Group, UMG, the world leader in music-based entertainment with operations in, over, in more than 60 countries. So between Carla and, and Jeffrey, these two are representing uh, a big piece of the artistic pie who have been very, very heavily impacted, be it by artificial intelligence music, writing, visual arts, etc. And she also represents film as well. So Carla herself dips into many different domains from video production to artistic production, concept art, illustration, so on and so forth. So with that said, we'll watch the rest of the swearing in. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. You may proceed with your opening statement. Thank you, Jack Coons and Rankin. Okay, before he continues talking, uh, I want it very important. I don't, I'm not, I don't look at this as a, as a, as a, uh, uh, a game of good and evil. These are, but these are opponents at opposite ends of the board, so to speak. So they're, even though they are humans and they have feelings and they have lives and they have livelihoods that they want to support, I want us to pay very close attention to their best interests from the perspective of business. And I the reason why I gave you everybody's profile is because when Ben starts to use certain language, we have to call him out on it. And I will be doing the same thing for every person at this panel with respect to what they're saying. Okay. Tillis for the opportunity to testify today. AI can help to unlock creativity, drive innovation, and open up new opportunities for creators and entrepreneurs across the United States. Okay. Opening statement, he's used the word creative twice but he has zero creative background. So what he's doing from a PR perspective, from a public, public relations perspective, is he's trying to position himself. He's trying to, to come in with a very gentle and very artistic approach to his business when his business has absolutely jack shit to do with artists. It just so happens to impact artists on a profound level. But pay very close attention to how he how he uses language that is art related, even though he probably has never stepped into any type of art studio or music studio before in his life, okay? As with any groundbreaking technology, AI raises important questions, and we recognize the depth of concern among creators. While we don't have all the answers, we're committed to an open and constructive dialogue, 
and we're actively working to address emerging concerns through new technology, standards, and good practices. Okay. We don't have all the answers yet. We're willing to have an open conversation. That's Well, for starters, it's ambiguous. We're willing to have a conversation doesn't mean anything. You can tell me anything you want. It doesn't mean I'm going to listen to you, right? But more importantly, he's saying we don't have all the answers yet. But like I said before, the cat's already out of the bag. I mean, this is rampant all over the all over the planet right now, and this is already impacting careers. So the fact that he's only willing to start having a conversation about this after this is already this, the bull is already in the china shop and half of the store is already destroyed, now is too late to start thinking about the ethics behind this, right? So let's call it out. At Stability AI, our goal is to unlock humanity's potential with AI technology. Unlock humanity's, humanity's potential. That's subjective, we'll see. We develop a range of AI models. These models are essentially software programs that can help a user to create new content. Our flagship model, Stable Diffusion, can take plain language instructions from a user and help to produce a new image. We're also working on research for safe language models that can help to produce new passages of text or software code. It's standard, that's what he does. So nothing to say. AI is a tool that can help to accelerate the creative process. In our written testimony, we shared examples of how Broadway designers, architects, photographers, and researchers are using our models to boost their productivity, experiment with new concepts, or even study new approaches to diagnosing complex medical disorders. Okay. Yes, an artist is a creator. Creative people know how to take, you can, you can hand them a, a lump of coal and they'll make something artistic out of it. Like, uh, like a stick of charcoal that you can draw with, technically, okay? But, again, he's positioning himself with, the, with what artists have done with this technology, or what they, what they potentially can do with this technology, without ever even thinking about that potential in the first place. His intention and the intention of his company was just to release this artificial intelligence out on the market. And he's now trying to reposition past gestures, past, past steps. He's trying to reposition this as deliberate when it's not deliberate because he just said two seconds ago that he wants to open a discussion about it. So he's, he's taking credit for something that he's not even doing. We are committed to releasing our models openly with appropriate safeguards. That means Too late for that. The safeguards are not in place already. He, anyways. Share the underlying software as a public resource. Creators, entrepreneurs, and researchers can customize these models to develop their own AI tools, build their own AI businesses, and find novel applications for AI that best support their work. Okay, what he's saying is right, right now is important, and we're going to be listening to Dana Rao in a moment from Adobe. What he's saying right there could potentially be a good thing. I have personally experimented with, with, with uh, MidJourney as a researching tool, as a referencing tool. I've also experimented with Firefly. It's good to know who you, you know, keep your enemies closer, so to speak, right? And um, what he's saying there is potentially redirecting the responsibility to somebody like Adobe or, or uh, similar type companies. Importantly, open models are transparent. We can look under the hood to scrutinize the technology for safety, performance, and bias. Safety, performance, and bias. Okay, he keeps saying safety, performance, and bias. I know I'm kind of picking apart everything he's saying right now because don't forget, he's not just a guy who's sitting there sharing his thoughts and feelings. This is this is somebody who who is sitting on potentially being one of the richest people in, in the future. <laughs> he he, you know, he'll he'll make Elon Musk look like a pauper in the next ten years with the technologies that he's sitting on right now. He has to represent the best interest of his clients who want to give him money. Okay, and what's important about this is that if businesses are giving him money, businesses are giving him money, not artists, then obviously whatever jargon he gives us right now is only to candy coat the fact that he, he wants money. He wants to be filthy rich. He's just released the software on the public and he's making money from this. Okay, so pay attention to that. These AI models start, study vast amounts of data to understand the subtle relationships between words, ideas, and visual or textual features, much like a person visiting an art gallery or library to learn how to draw or how to write. They learn the irreducible facts and structures that make up our systems of communication. 
And through this process, they develop an adaptable body of knowledge that they can then apply to help produce new and unseen content. In other words, compositions that did not appear in the training data and may not have appeared anywhere else. Okay, he's, he's positioning himself as saying that the, the results of our software, the results of our, our artificial intelligence, look nothing like the original source work. And that's not true. Because if I want to go, I've gone online multiple times and I looked up Bloodborne style art because that's the kind of stuff that I produce. And I got multiple, multiple images that looks like, like it look like they could have been done by, by, from software very easily. So they're very clearly ripping off the art and the IPs, the intellectual property of companies, of artists, of individuals. Artists like Carla Ortiz, who's a very established artist, She's going to express in a moment how much of her work she, she learned had been ripped off from her without her permission, without her being remunerated for it. So what he's saying is just flat, flat out not true. These models don't rely on a single work in their training data, nor do they store that training data. But instead, they learn by observing recurring patterns over billions of images and trillions of words of text. That don't belong to him, and he was never given access to. We believe that developing these models is an acceptable and socially beneficial use of existing content that is permitted by fair use and helps to promote the progress of science and useful arts. Fair use and a culture of open learning is essential to recent developments in AI. It is essential to help make AI useful, safe, unbiased. And okay, so what he's saying here is we can't make effective artificial intelligence without stealing from people. It's just the way, we, if we wanted to make it work the way we want it to work, then we kind of have to rip everybody off. Millions of people, millions of creators, we just have no choice. So if, if you want a good program, you're going to have to be willing to be stolen from. No, that's not true. Doubtful that these groundbreaking... And not to mention the fact that he this theft is on such a massive scale. How can you keep track of whose work you've stolen from? Okay, this is very, I'm making very important points because I've heard this hearing multiple times already. So I know where this is going. So pay attention to that point. Apologies would be possible without it. The US has established global leadership in AI thanks in part to an adaptable and principles based fair use doctrine that balances creative rights with open innovation. None of that's true. None of that's true. There's no, he's, he wasn't given any permission to steal any of that shit. We acknowledge emerging concerns. Really Acknowledge. Okay. You and I are in a relationship. I spill my guts up to you saying you are destroying my life. You're destroying my life. What you're, 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 you're taking from me. You're stealing from me. You're not giving anything back. I can't make a livelihood. I've got kids to raise. I've got, I've got, I've got bills to pay. I've got food to put on the table. You, you've stolen everything from me. I have nothing left. And you're pleading. You're begging. You're crying. Can you please stop? And he responds, I acknowledge your feelings. Don't you want to give him the back of your hand if somebody says something like that? That's basically saying, yeah, I heard you. Anything else? No. Okay, bye. Acknowledging doesn't mean anything. Acknowledging just means, yeah, I heard you. Fine. Can we go? Can we move on? And we don't have all the answers. But we're Again, doesn't have all the answers. Too, too bloody late for that. Actively working to address these concerns, as I say, through technology, standards, and good practices. First, we've committed to voluntary opt-outs. Okay. Good practices. I'll give you an example. I, I've been, we, uh, me and my girlfriend have been trying to get people to to fix our front stairs because our front stairs are in very, very bad shape in our house. And we've been calling construction companies over and over and over again. And it's amazing how construction companies just, they never return your bloody phone calls. We contacted one guy who we thought was really, really cool. He didn't, rep he, he came, he showed, he checked it out. He gave us, he gave us an estimate and everything like that. And then he ghosted us for two weeks. We were trying to find out because we asked him for, we asked him if we could make an alteration to make it less expensive. He said, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll let you know. A week passes, two week passes, he doesn't reply. I end up calling, he answers the phone because he didn't know it was me. And um, he go, oh, it kind of caught him off guard. And he says, yeah, yeah, I'll call you back. And then he didn't. And then another week passes. And then another week passes. And we basically forgot about him at this point, forget it. He comes back after the fact and he says, yeah, okay, we've got this new quote for you. And 
would I hire somebody like that? He's already proven multiple times that he's unethical. He's already proven multiple times he's unreliable. Am I going to give my money to a guy who can't even return a, an effing phone call? No, you've missed that chance. You've already proven you're unreliable. Well, that's what he's doing over here. He's proving he, he's already proven he's unreliable. And now he's trying to paint himself as being somebody reliable. Too late. So that creators can choose if Sorry, I'm getting emotional, but this shit just pisses me off. I hate this jargon, this legal jargon pisses me off. Want their online work to be used for AI training. We've received opt-out requests for over 160 million images to date, and we're incorporating these into upcoming training. We're helping to develop digital opt-out labels as well that follow the content wherever it goes on the internet. Second, we're implementing features to help users and tech platforms identify AI content. Images generated through our platform can be digitally stamped with metadata and watermarks to indicate if the content was generated with AI. These signals can help ensure that users exercise appropriate care when interacting with AI content and help tech platforms distinguish AI content before amplifying it online. We welcome Adobe's leadership in driving the development of some of these open standards. Third, we've developed layers of mitigations to make it easier to do the right thing with AI and harder to do the wrong thing. Today, we filter data sets for unsafe content. We test and evaluate our models before release. We apply ethical use licenses, disclose known risks, filter content generated through our computing services, and implement new techniques to mitigate bias. Okay. Everything he said right now, okay? Think about what he just said right now. Um, he is saying we're doing all the steps we can to mitigate, meaning to reduce, to avoid problems right so he 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 you know we make sure there's no biases so you know if you look up a judge you're not going to get pictures of of middle-aged white men all the time that you're going to get people that represent the whole spectrum of of, of races and cultures and sexual orientations etc cetera, etc cetera. that's what he means with regards to bias or content that might be inappropriate like pornography or any kind of any kind of uh hurtful content or anything like that um but he doesn't say anything anything with regards to artist rights and remember that's the core of this program is stealing imagery okay so he's stealing we can create art we can create photography with it that looks like it was created by a real human being models photographers artists illustrators are all being ripped off and having their jobs taken from them and he didn't even address that in his code of ethics Pay attention to his language. This was this was scanned. This this document was scanned over multiple, multiple, multiple times by writers, by by public relations, by different organizations that make sure that everything that he's covering all the bases. He's not covering. He's covering all the bases that are in his best interest. As we integrate AI into the digital economy, we believe the community will continue to value human generated art. Screw you. Perhaps value it at a premium. Smartphones didn't destroy photography, and word processes didn't diminish literature, despite radically transforming the economics of creation. So now he's trying to he's trying to align himself with smartphones. Smartphones created cameras. They didn't create artificial intelligence that stole photography from people. If I pick up my phone and I take a picture with my phone, I took the picture with my camera. Okay? So I don't know why he's aligning himself with cell phones here. Instead, they gave rise to new demand for services new markets for content, and new creators. We expect the same will be true of AI, and we welcome an ongoing dialogue with the creative community about the fair deployment of these technologies. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. Mr. Rapp. Yeah, so I think that the, the synopsis of this is that his best interest is business. His best interest is making sure that his program doesn't have any, uh, you know, legal loopholes or ethical loopholes that where he can get caught, you know, producing pornography or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but he, his interest is he just keeps saying, yeah, I'll listen to the artists. But the, you can tell that the artists are really at the at the back of his mind. It's not his priority right now because he's trying to protect his wallet right now. Now we're, now we're going to listen to Dana Rao, who represents Adobe. And I think he has a very important testimony here. Ranking Member Tillis and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Dana Rao and I'm General Counsel and, as Senator Coons noted, Chief Trust Officer at Adobe. I'm happy to provide you with a secret certificate you need to get that title if you'd like after the hearing. Sure. Um, since our founding in 1982, uh, Adobe has pioneered transformative technologies in all types of digital creation. 
from digital documents like PDF to image editing with Photoshop. Our products allow our customers, who range from aspiring artists to wartime photojournalists, to advertisers and more, to unleash their creativity, perfect their craft, empower their businesses in a digital world. AI is the latest disruptive technology we've been incorporating into our tools to help creators realize their potential. You've all seen the magic of text-to-image generative AI. Type in the prompt, cat driving a 1950 sports car through the desert, and in seconds, you'll see multiple variations of a cat on a retro road trip appear before your eyes. We've launched generative AI in our own tools. Just notice the tone. If you're, when you were listening to Ben Brooks's testimony, he was very, uh, uh, he's, he's a younger guy, right? But he's, he's, he's professional. He uses a lot of big words. He, he's he's kind of got that, he's got that legal jargon side of it to make him sound more professional, more competent as far as he's concerned. Dana Rao is taking a little bit of a friendlier tone in his approach. He cracked a little joke at the beginning. He's using friendly terms. He smiles a, a lot more. Little things to pay attention to. Adobe Firefly, and is provided, it's proved to be wildly popular with our creative professionals and consumers alike. Now, I'm gonna mention something about Adobe Firefly. I've used Adobe Firefly, and you can tell that 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 it's, it, the what's training Firefly is a much less robust less vast database of information because with Stability AI, they just basically, they have free reign over the entire internet. They can just grab anything they want, anywhere they want. Where with, with Adobe, Adobe is taking an ethical stance on this using, using with a caveat there, but um, using already licensed stock images or what he says, pay attention to what he says next. In my written testimony, I explore a comprehensive framework for responsible AI development. That includes addressing misinformation, harmful bias, creator rights, and intellectual property. He just mentioned creator rights, something that Ben failed to do through his entire opening statement. Today, given Adobe's focus on our millions of creative customers and our leadership in AI, I'll His creative customers. He represents artists. If Adobe did anything to screw me over or any other artist in any other, produ in other, any other field, uh, they would be boycotted. Their business would be bust because people would say, screw you, you completely screwed us over. So it's in Adobe's best interest, it's in Dana Rao's best interest to make me happy and make me feel like they represent us, the artists, because the artists are the ones who have been using their programs. I've been using Photoshop for almost 25 years at this point, okay, and all of their suite of, of apps. So I'm his customer, I'm his client. It's on how the United States can continue to lead the world in AI development by both supporting the access to data that AI requires and strengthening creator rights. The question of creator data rights. access is critical for the- Okay, mention with, with, with Ben Brooks, which words did he repeat the most often? Bias, ethical, safe, etc. And he would acknowledge artists. Dana has already said multiple times, creative rights, creative rights, creative rights. He keeps talking about the creator's rights. You can see and Adobe's got writers and lawyers also going scanning over the script too. They know who they're aligning with. Development of AI, because AI is only as powerful and as good as the data on which it is trained. Like the human brain, AI learns from the information you give it. In the AI's case, the data it's trained on. Training on a larger data set can help ensure your results are more accurate because the AI has more facts to learn from. A larger data set will also help the AI avoid perpetuating harmful biases in its results by giving it a wider breadth of experiences from which the, it can build its understanding of the world. More data means better answers and fewer biases. Given those technical realities, the United States and governments should support access to data to ensure that AI innovation can flourish accurately and responsibly. However, one of the most important implications of AI's need for data is the impact on copyright and creators' rights. It's the fourth time. There are many outstanding questions in this space, including whether creating an AI model, which is a software program from a set of images, is a permitted fair use, and whether that analysis changes if the output of that AI model creates an image that is substantially similar to an image on which it is trained. These questions will certainly be addressed by courts and perhaps Congress, and we are prepared to help assist in those discussions. Adobe recognized the potential impact of AI on creators and society, and we've taken several steps. First, we trained our own generative AI tool, Adobe Firefly, 
only on licensed images from our Adobe Stock Collection, which is our stock photography collection, openly licensed content, and works that are in the public domain where the copyright is expired. Okay, that's very important. And this is the little, that's the little caveat I was talking about before. You have to be aware of, like, now that, now that Adobe is taking this very, very important stance with regards to AI, um, their user license agreement is starting to become something we need to pay very, very close attention to because now we have artificial intelligence in there. And what is considered a copyright, expired copyright? What? Because that basically means if I've been producing art for 25 years, the better you get, the longer you've been doing it for, the older your artwork gets. And perhaps there's, the, uh, Adobe, according to Adobe's license user, user license agreement, that copyright expires at a certain point. We, it's very important to read the fine print with Adobe as well, because they could be doing some sleight of hand here as well that might not be in our best interest either. I want to talk about that more moving forward, but that's the little, that's the little something we need to pay attention to. This approach supports creators and customers by training on a data set that is designed to be commercially safe. In addition, we're advocating for other steps we can all take to strengthen creator rights. First, we believe creators should be able to attach a do not train tag to their work. With industry and government support, we can ensure AI data crawlers will read and respect this tag, giving creators the option to keep their data out of AI training data sets. Okay, something I want to mention as well. I mean, I've been using Adobe every, I use Adobe every day. I teach on it, I work on it daily. In my opinion, the most ethical way to approach the subject is not by embedding it in some long, exhausting, fine print legal document and then having a little check mark at the bottom of there that you can barely see. That button should be right in the forefront. Uh, the same way Apple, you know, when it comes to blocking uh, advertising content and something, something that Mark Zuckerberg and, and, and Google were completely at arms with. They've been at war with Apple because of this, because it's as easy as just flicking a, flicking a button. That's it. It's extremely easy to access. It's right there. And in my opinion, the default state of this button should be off. Do not train, not on. You shouldn't have to go and look for the button to turn it off. It should automatically be off and you should be prompted and asked, would you like to, are you willing to use this as a training thing? Because then that puts, that allows me to kind of sit back and negotiate whether or not it's worth it for me. And am I going to get anything from this? Am I handing you content for free or am I being remunerated for this? Maybe we could work something out with my membership, with my Adobe cost. Little things to think about moving forward, because otherwise they're just taking shit for free. Second, creators using AI tools want to ensure they can obtain copyright protection over their work in this new era of AI-assisted digital creation. An AI output alone may not receive copyright protection, but we believe the combination of human expression and AI expression will and should. Content editing tools should enable creators to obtain a copyright by allowing them to distinguish the AI work from the human work. In my written testimony, I discuss our open standards-based technology content credentials, which can help enable both of these creator protections. Finally, even though Adobe has trained its AI on permitted work, we understand the concern that an artist can be economically dispossessed by an AI trained on their work that generates art in their style, in the Frank Sinatra example you gave. We believe artists should be protected against this type of economic harm, and we propose Congress establish a new federal anti-impersonation right that would give artists a right to enforce against someone intentionally attempting to impersonate their style or likeness. Holding people accountable who misuse AI tools is a solution we believe goes to the heart of some of the issues our customers have. And this new right would help address that concern. The United States has led the world through technological transformations in the past and we have all learned it is important to be proactively responsible at the impact of these technologies. Pairing innovation with responsible innovation will ensure that AI ultimately becomes a transformative and true benefit to our society. Okay, Real, again, really, really important. He's, he keeps making sure that, that the creators feel safe and that Adobe represents a company that is going to be the arbiters of this content, that, that it's not just gonna be free reign, wild west, go and take whatever you want type of stuff, that we have control over that process and we're gonna feel safe. If we're gonna say yes, it has to be under the artist terms Ultimately, that decision needs to be needs to come to us. You can see that Adobe plays a very important role in this. Where Ben is just he's just trying to make cash, right? So I don't think the ethical and legal side of the use of this technology should have anything to do with stability AI. 
this should be entirely up to the up to Adobe and and like-minded companies and and companies that have the same best interests as Adobe to advocate for. Thank you, Chair Coons, Ranking Member Tillis, and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Professor. Now, if you're still here, thank you for <laughs> for toughing it out. I know we're already like 40 minutes into this video. It's going to be a long video because, well, it's a hor it's a court uh, a court hearing. This is why I'm breaking it up into multiple parts. Um, but it's very, very important for us to get an idea on the pieces on the board. Um, so thank you for sticking it out. I appreciate you still being here. You're, you're patient. Go grab a coffee, stretch your legs, and pause the video and come back when you're ready. Chair Coons, Ranking Member Tillis, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. I'm a professor of law in AI, machine learning, and data science at Emory University, where I was hired as part of Emory's AI Humanity Initiative. Although we're still a long way from the science fiction version of artificial general intelligence that thinks, feels, and refuses to open the pod bay doors, recent advances in machine learning and artificial intelligence... If you didn't get that, that reference, then you're not old like me. <laughs> Put the gun down, Dave. So that's, a, that's an old person joke in case you didn't catch it. ...have captured the public's attention and apparently lawmakers' interest. We now have large language models, or LLMs, that can pass the bar exam, carry on a conversation, create new music, and new visual art. Nonetheless, copyright law does not and should not recognize computer systems as authors. Even where an AI produces images, text, or music that is indistinguishable from human-authored works, it makes no sense to think of a machine learning program as the author. The copyright... So right away, remember the opening statement. Remember, you're always going to hear, to remember what you hear first, right? So if you're ever making a YouTube thumbnail, you don't want the most important information to be at the end of the title. You want it to be at the first words in your title, so to speak, because that's what's going to resonate with people when they're skipping through all this kind of stuff quickly. People's patience is not there. So what he's seeing right off the bat is we cannot recognize what's created by a computer as being copyrightable material, that art and creation is the responsibility and of the human, not the machine. And he's making that very strict divide between the two. We can't confuse the two. That act rightly reserves copyright for original works of authorship. As the Supreme Court explained long ago in the 1880s... He's also positioning something else too. He's saying if, you, if you're just creating AI generated music or art, that's not copyrightable and that should not be payable either, right? Because if it's not copyrightable, then it's just it's just garbage. It's just fluff that you're throwing out on the on the table, basically, and anybody can grab it. It's a buffet. I really highly recommend you check out Brad Colbo's recent video where he talks about how you can't make money with AI because it's already a very oversaturated market as far as that goes. Um, check it out because that's what's happening. So many people went, oh my God, I can, I can produce professional looking art effortlessly and I never had to go to school for it. That everybody started dumping all this kind of stuff all over Amazon and merch and all this type of production and nobody's making a penny from it because it immediately became an oversaturated market. So he's making that distinction. Make all you want. You're not gonna make a penny from it. All of that money needs to be going to the creators. What he's saying is very significant. Okay, so Burrow Giles with the graphic. Authorship entails original intellectual conception. An AI can't produce a work that reflects its own original intellectual conception because it has none. Thus, when AI models produce content with little or no human oversight, there is no copyright in those outputs. Mm -hmm. However, humans using AI as tools of expression may claim authorship in the fi if the final form of the work reflects their original intellectual conception in sufficient detail. And I've elaborated in my written submissions how this will depend on the circumstances. Hold on to your rough sketches. They matter. <laughs> Save your work in progress so you can show how you, how you build a project, how you build a song, how you build a dance, how you build a performance. That process what he's saying right now is going to become more and more important moving forward. Why do you think, for instance, finding an old study sketch by Leonardo da Vinci is incredibly valuable? Finding where the earliest versions of a comic book where, where 
uh, um, the f where the first iterations of a character are introduced in their earliest form become valuable because it's demonstrating to you the process of development that the human went through. Where uh, AI just skips all over, all uh, skips over all over all of that stuff, and jumps straight into a finished product. Training generative AI on copyrighted works is usually fair use because it falls into the category of non-expressive use. Courts addressing technologies such as reverse engineering, search engines, and plagiarism detection software have held that these non-expressive uses are fair use. These cases reflect copyright's fundamental distinction between protectable original expression and unprotectable facts, ideas, and abstractions. Whether training an LLM is a non-expressive use depends ultimately on the outputs of the model. If an LLM is trained properly and operated with appropriate safeguards, its outputs will not resemble its inputs in a way that would trigger copyright liability. Training such an LLM on copyrighted works would thus be justified under current fair use principles. It's understand that generative AI are not designed to copy original expression. One of the most common misconceptions about generative AI is the notion that the training data is somehow copied into the model. Machine learning models are influenced by the data. They would be pretty useless without it, but they typically don't copy the data in any literal sense. So rather than thinking of an LLM as copying the training data like a scribe in a monastery, it makes more sense to think of it as learning from the training data like a student. If an LLM like GPT-3 is working as intended, it doesn't copy the training data at all. The only copying that takes place is when the training corpus is assembled and pre-processed, and that is what you need a fair use justification for. Whether a generative AI produces truly new content or simply conjures up an infringing cut and paste of works in the training data depends on how it is trained. Accordingly, companies should adopt best practices to reduce the risk of copyright infringement and other related harms, and I've elaborated on some of these best practices in my written submission. Failure to adopt best practices may potentially undermine claims of fair use. Generative AI does not, in my opinion, require a major overhaul of the US copyright system at this time. If Congress is considering new legislation in relation to AI and copyright, that legislation should be targeted at clarifying the application of existing fair use jurisprudence, not overhauling it. Israel, Singapore and South Korea have recently incorporated fair use into their copyright statutes because these countries recognize that the flexibility of the fair use doctrine gives US companies and US researchers a significant competitive advantage. Several other jurisdictions, most notably Japan, the United Kingdom and the European Union, have specifically adopted exemptions for text data mining that allow use of copyrighted works as training for machine learning and other purposes. Copyright law should encourage the developers of generative AI to act responsibly. However, if our laws become overly restrictive, then corporations and researchers will simply move key aspects of technology development overseas to our competitors. Thank you. Okay, so I might have misinterpreted him a little bit there. It sounds to me like he's actually, he's advocating uh, uh, on behalf of the technology itself. So he didn't, that, so that maybe I wasn't reading his body language the way, the way I thought it was, because what he's basically saying is, it's not actually stealing from anybody directly. It's um, it's just kind of a, a student. It's in the room and it's learning from different things, uh, which is a very. I don't think that's. I don't think that really helps the situation with regards to artists. I don't think his argument actually helps anything because again, it's being trained based off of artists. And he's saying, yeah, okay, it is taking from a lot of different people. Um, but it's not stealing from them directly. So if you put a safeguard on that, if you stop that from happening, then you are preventing this technology from advancing. And if you don't, if you don't allow it to go, then the terror it's win, right? So that last statement kind of st kind of put a, 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 a his foot down with regards to uh, his stance on this. It's that we need to beat our enemies to the punch because we need to be able to develop it to the best of our abilities. So 
it sounds to me like his bias might be leaning a little bit more um, in the direction of the technology itself. So I'm going to keep my eye out for this guy because he could he could sway the conversation in a way that I'm not particularly happy with. But to me, what's extremely important is that this training, that this development of this program is is ethical. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just misinterpreting. He's just probably Professor, smarter than I am. Ortiz. Yes. Chairman Coons, ranking member Tillis, and esteemed members of the committee, it is an honor to testify before you today about AI and copyright. My name is Carla Ortiz. I am a concept artist, illustrator, and fine artist. And you may not know my name, but you know my work. My paintings have shaped the words, world of blockbuster Marvel films and TV shows, including Guardians of the Galaxy 3, Amazing Black movie. Panther, Loki, you know. <laughs> um, but specifically, the one I'm most happiest of is that I my work helped shape the look of Doctor Strange in the first Doctor mm. Strange movie. I have to brag about that a little bit, sir. <laughs> I love what I did. Carla cannot help being human. You know, it's all these lawyers with their beards and their suits. And Carla always walks into a room laughing. She brings levity everywhere she goes. The first time I ever met her was at um, uh, was at the schoolism workshop that they were hosting at the school I taught at, at the Siege of Old Montreal. And uh, she walked in and she, she giggles every five seconds. The fact that she didn't giggle through this entire testimony is testament to how focused she is. Because I'm sure she wanted to probably laugh through the whole thing. That's just her personality. But I love the fact that she's bringing humanity back into this conversation. It's sorely needed. I love my craft. Artists train their entire lives to be able to bring the imaginary to life. All of us who engage in this craft love every little bit of it. Through hard work, support of loved ones, and dedication. Okay. I Carla's opening statements. Okay. Notice that at no point does she have a, she has her own career interest as far as finances are concerned. But listen to the opening words that she's used. Love, passion, dedication, her craft. This is personal to her. This is hers. This is something she feels something for. And that is a very strong human emotion. She's not trying to represent the best interest of businesses with the bottom line, with, with shareholders. She's representing humanity at this table. So pay attention to that language. Able to make a good living from my craft via the entertainment industry. An industry that thrives when artists rights to consent credit and compensation look at her body language look at her go back and watch the rest of this testimony pay attention to how the, the these other individuals are talking they're sitting their hands are folded in front of them i love body language too i studied animation and body language is a subject i'm very passionate about they're sitting their arms are folded they might go like this they're kind of bracing themselves because they are a bit nervous as well they're standing in front of senate right and they're kind of nervous but they're sitting there and they're folding their hands and every now and then they might crack a joke or whatever watch carla's hands Watch her face. Watch her. Listen to her emotions. She's she's touched her chest about six or seven times. This is a feeling she's sharing with you, right? She's not saying you didn't see Ben Brooks going at stability at AI. We want to share our our feelings with you. He's not doing it. His hands stayed folded and very and very braced in this triangular kind of pose the entire time. He's very calm. He's very he created he had good eye eye contact and everything like that, but his hands stayed fixed in this very power pose, so to speak. She keeps touching herself. It's very important. I respect it. I have never worried about my future as an artist until now. Hmm. Generative AI is unlike any other technology that has come before. It is a technology that uniquely consumes and exploits the hard work, creativity, and innovation of. Notice her her emotional pitch change as well. She went from emotional to laughing, and now she's getting very stern. None of the other people were doing this. This is very. This is business. For her, it's personal. No other tool is like this. When I found, when first researching AI, horrified me. I found that almost the entirety of my work, the work of almost every artist I know, and the work of hundreds of thousands of artists had been taken without our consent, credit, or compensation. These works were stolen and used to train for-profit technologies with data sets that contain billions of image and text data pairs. Through my research, I... You have to think, for any of you business people out there listening, lawyers out there listening to this, 
I want you to understand what she's expressing right now. This is her life. This is her livelihood. She was raised with this passion to draw. This is a part of her human history. This is how she's made friends. This is the community she's a part of. If you're a member of a church, if you're a member of a, of, of, of a different group, if you're a su different support group, if you've had a certain similar history, art is her identity, it's her community, it's her family. Even though I've only met Carla once years ago, she's a part of my family. I feel a kinship with her as a result of that. And what this AI, what this feels like, to somebody who's, who's, whose existence, whose purpose, whose livelihood is tied into their profession. It's not just a job, it's her existence, it's her identity. It feels like you just rounded up a bunch of them like, like chickens in a hen house and just squeezed out all of, all of their essence and discarded their carcasses on the side of the road. It's so exploitative, it's disgusting. And that's the problem. Do I think that AI is, do I think that AI in and of itself is evil? No, I think that the, the assholes who are, who are stealing from people are doing something unethical. This could be a tool if harnessed, if, if, if regulated by the right bodies. It could be a tool that we could give it permission to use, that we could get paid to train ourselves, the artists, the ones who fucking created the art in the first place. But you can't just go and squeeze it out of us like some like some like some meat grinder and then throw our carcasses on the side of the road. This is what she's fighting for. This is why she's being emotional. She's bringing humanity back into this. The ones that actually created this in the first place. Many AI companies gather. Just give me a break. Yes. Copyrighted training data by relying on a practice called data laundering. This is where a company outsources data collection to a third party under the pretext of research to then immediately use commercially. I found these companies use vague terms like publicly available data or openly licensed content to disguise their extensive reliance on copyrighted works. No matter what they're saying, these models are illegally trained on copyrighted works. Euphemistic language. This is one of the reasons why George Carlin is my favorite comedian of all time. He said, I don't want to hear this, this euphemistic bullshit. I want, my, I want that turd right under my nose where I can get a good whiff of it, right? And what she's saying is, is the Bible truth. It's theft. It's just theft. It's just theft. I, I mean, I, I, to, sh to share an example, somebody had sent me an image produced in the likeness of my artwork. It took them no training. It took them no effort. They said, look, look what I can produce with, with this. Look what I, was met, what I managed to pull off. And they showed this to my community and they said, yeah, that looks like it could be done by you. You can kind of tell it's AI, but we're at the early stages of this shit. But look at how easily what took me 25 years to develop was taken like that and to produce something that I, I can't claim. I can't claim I didn't do it or I did. And that's a problem. To add even more insult to injury, I found that these for-profit companies were not only permitting users to use our full names to generate imagery, but encouraging it. For example, Polish artist Greg Rutkowski had had his name used as a prompt in AI products over 400,000 times. And thus are the lower ends of the estimate. You know, I, I made that, I'd made multiple videos in the past where I was talking about, you know, my feelings, thoughts and feelings about AI and everything like that, trying to take an unbiased, perspective of it which I still try to do and a lot of people had said Adam you're you know you're already successful you run a YouTube channel you run a school you've been doing this professionally for years you're 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 not you're not in touch and my argument to that is the bigger you are the harder you fall the more you've the more you've accomplished over time the more it can be taken away from you you're not somebody who's who's just starting off who doesn't have a body of professional work yet you have, in your particular case, what threatens you is your purpose. Should I even bother being an artist in the first place? When you're at the beginning of the, when you're at the beginning of your development, the threat is whether or not you should even bother. Because there's already, I can already do it with AI like that. When you've been doing it for 20, 25 years, then, or whatever length of time you've been doing it, you've accumulated a body of work that can be stolen from you. And an artist like Carla Ortiz, or, or Piotr Jablonski, I can't remember, she referenced a Polish artist there. Um, uh, 
they are so famous, they are so celebrated as artists that they're much more likely to be stolen from. They are the Fabergé eggs of the artistic community, and that is a very high prize, right? My own name, Carlo Ortiz, has also been used by these companies thousands of times. Never once did I give consent, never once have I gotten credit, never once have I gotten compensation. It should come as no surprise that major productions are replacing artists with generative AI. Goldman Sachs estimates that a generative AI will diminish or outright destroy approximately 300 million full-time jobs worldwide. As ranking member Tillis mentioned earlier, copyright-reliant industries alone contribute $1.8 trillion of value to the U.S. GDP, accounting for 7.76% of the entire U.S. economy. This is an industry that employs 9.6 million American workers alone. The game plan is simple, to go as fast as possible, to create mesmerizing tales of progress, and to normalize the exploitation of artists as quickly as possible. They hope when we catch our breath, it'll be too late to right the wrongs, and exploiting Americans will become an accepted way of doing things. But that game can't succeed, as we are here now, given this the urgency it so desperately deserves. What she's saying is something that we've seen time and time again uh, when it comes to big money, and that is the companies that are pushing for this product to be released, for pushing for its huge success, which AI is, this is, this is, this is all, all anybody's talking about, is to create so much damage in the name of progress that the, the, the forest fire has completely destroyed any potential, uh, any, any, any potential for there to be something to be salvaged at the end of it. That was a very broken sentence. You get my point. You can't salvage anything. It's all gone. You've destroyed it all. It's too, it's too freaking late. And they're trying to move at such ne neck breaking speeds that you just can't keep up with the progress of this thing to the point where you just say, you know, I can't do it anymore. I can't. It's exhausting. And that's what she's saying. She's saying we have to put a firm stop to this. We don't, don't fall under the impression that it's gone. It's too far now. There's nothing we can do about it at this point. That we need to stop it now and prevent that from happening because that's exactly the tactic that they're trying, that every every big business has ever tried to do. You get so big so fast that the ethics doesn't have time to catch up with it. Congress should act to ensure what we call the three C's and a T, consent, credit, compensation, and transparency. The work of artists like myself were taken without our consent, credit, nor compensation, and then used to compete with us directly in our own markets. Mm. An outrageous act that under any other context would immediately be seen as unfair, immoral, and illegal. Mm. Senators... Uh, just think about that for a sec. You know? <laughs> it's like you, 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 spend, you spend 10 years raising a, a, a child, right? Uh, 20 years raising a child, and then somebody kidnaps your kid. And you go, and, and you start screaming, give me my kid back. And he goes, what are you talking about? Your kid's my kid. You know, I raised that child. They look like me. They've got my name. They've got my DNA. Prove it. <laughs> you know, think of the gall of that in that context. That's exactly what's happening. This is her, this is, again, her creation, like her own child, her own family. This is taken away from her without her permission and then pretends to be her. All within the space of weeks. That's disgusting, isn't it? There is a fundamental fairness issue here. I'm asking Congress to address this by enacting laws that require these companies to obtain consent, give credit, pay compensation, and be transparent. Thank you. My camera overheated after an hour and 10 minutes of recording in 4K, so it shut down. <laughs> Took advantage, went and I had lunch with my girlfriend, and we're back. Cooled off and ready to rumble. We have one last testimony, Jeffrey Harleston representing the arts in the musical industry, so let's have a listen. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. Last but certainly not least, Mr. Harleston. Before he starts to talk, pay attention to his body language. Watch his arms, watch his demeanor, his voice and his face and his... And his and how he communicates is very calm and very professional. But pay attention to his body language. Thank you, Chairman Coons, Ranking Member Tillis, and members of the committee. It's an honor to be here before you today. 
Uh, I'm Jeff Harleston. I'm the general counsel of Universal Music Group. And what is Universal Music Group? We're the world leader in music-based entertainment. We are home to legendary record labels such as Motown, Def Jam, Island, Blue Note, Capital, just to name a few. We have a music publishing company that signs songwriters. And we have a music merchandising company as well. And an audio... You notice that? Him, just like Carla, are, are both either artists or people who work with artists all the time who are not trained in the art of bullshitting people into thinking that you're, 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 you've got your shit together. <laughs> He's fidgeting a little bit. He is showing a little bit of nervousness in his body language. I would be petrified in his position. I think, I think both of them are holding themselves extremely well. But uh, uh, you notice the lack of bullshit training that these two, that these two individuals have audio visual division that because otherwise he would have been trained to just sit there stoic keep your hands grasped like this always make full eye contact make full full eye contact and keep your eyebrows raised to make yourself look innocent and speak with a very calm demeanor he's kind of getting into the self self-soothing gestures and stuff like that but i don't want that to distract you from his testimony award-winning documentaries based on music umg identifies develops artists across every musical genre i think it's it's fair to note that Frank Sinatra is one of our artists, and I think based on what we didn't hear today, I'm not sure if we'll be pursuing a, a developing artist out of Delaware named Chris Coons, but maybe we'll get back to that. Uh okay, again, first thing he mentions is the artists. Carla mentions this. Dina Rao mentions this. Um, this is very, very significant. You can see right up at the, f at the forefront what his focus and what his priority is. Then you will not. <laughs> Even though he's technically a business guy. Um, all jokes aside, um, I've been with the company, I've been honored to be with the company for 30 years, and most of the time I've spent as a lawyer, but I've also spent some time leading the Def Jam label, and also as the management team of Geffen Records, so I've been on both sides of, of the business. Um, and it reflects in his body language, doesn't it? We have also helped broker deals with digital services, platforms, social media outlets, where you, all of you, can access the music that you love. It's been my life's honor to work with countless talented and creative artists. Their creativity is the soundtrack to our lives. He uses creativity in the context of somebody who knows artists, who works, works with artists every single day, not somebody who developed a software who's trying to position himself with artists. There's a very big difference between the way Jeffrey and the way Ben used the word creative. Very different. And without the fundamentals of copyright, we might not have ever known them. I'd like to make four key points to you today. The first, copyright, artists, and human creativity must be protected. Priority number one. First thing he puts on the bill is, is the artist first. Art and human creativity are central to our identity. Artists and creators have rights. They must be respected. I just said it about Carla, didn't I? Right? This is not just what a person's job. It's not their mandate. It's their identity. Okay, this is their livelihood. This is who they've been since they were five years old. He recognizes that. If I leave that. you with one message today, it is this. AI in the service of artists and creativity can be a very, very good thing. But AI that uses, or worse yet, appropriates the work of these artists and creators and their creative expression, their name, their image, their likeness, their voice, without authorization, without consent, simply is not a good thing. I'd say if there was one thing that I would have asked you to listen to this entire night, this entire, this entire video, it would have been this, this one sentence he just said. I agree with, with everything he's saying right there. I just, I'm, I, I recently saw a video with, you know, Peter McKinnon, the photographer, has been talking a lot about AI and he's been messing around with it a lot. Uh, that's been a very big part of his videos. He doesn't have a bias for or against art. He says, use it if you want it, don't use it if you don't. Um, um, but uh, if it's used by an artist to create artwork and the artist is the one whose voice and whose message is received first and that isn't taken from the artist, and the artist is properly credited for that work, then I don't see the harm in that necessarily. I do see the harm in the fact that it's appropriated, as he said very eloquently, it's appropriated, and that that person, that artist who provided that training was not compensated, was not recognized for that, as it is today. 
The second point I want to make is that generative AI raises challenging issues in the copyright space. I think you've heard from the other panelists, and they all would agree. We are the stewards at Universal of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of copyrighted creative works from our songwriters and artists, and they've entrusted us to honor, value, and protect them. As have Adobe, right? They, I have trusted Adobe to be at the best interest of my work digitally for 20 plus years. And this is exactly the same responsibility that Jeffrey's stating he has as well. People trust him. Artists have trusted him for decades. And he, it's his priority to protect that trust and to value that trust. Today they are being used to train generative AI systems without authorization. This irresponsible AI is violative of copyright law and completely unnecessary. There is a robust digital marketplace today in which thousands of responsible companies properly obtain the rights that they need to operate. There's no reason that the same rules that apply to everyone else should not apply equally to AI companies and AI developers. That is an extremely important point. Ben, uh, uh, ben Brooks stated in his opening statement that it is necessary for us to, if I'm going to put it in plain language, essential for them to steal and steal uh, um, indiscriminately in order to properly train our software. And we will take artists into advisement, so to speak, in a very flippant kind of way. And what Jeffrey Harlston is saying is um, taking it and being very blunt about that taking it is just plainly immoral, illegal, and should stop immediately. So he's saying we have access to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of resources from artists that, that are all ready and willing to give us permission if, if, if our conditions are met, which could train, do all the training you need in order to make this AI work for the artist and benefit the artist. So there's no reason to steal in the first place, as Ben says is necessary, right? So I like the fact that he's taking the stance. I like a lot of what he's saying, actually. My third point, AI can be used responsibly to enhance artistic expression. Just like other technologies before, artists can use AI to enhance their art. AI tools have long been used in recording studios for drum tracks, chord progressions, and even creative, creating immersive audio technologies. One of our distributed artists used a generative AI tool to simultaneously release a single in six languages hmm. in his own voice on the same day. That's cool. The generative AI tool extended the artist's creative intent and expression with his consent to new markets and fans instantly. In this case, consent is the key. And I bet there isn't a single person listening to me commenting on this right now that disagrees, that, that doesn't agree that that's perfectly fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong. If I wanted to publish my YouTube videos in 30 different languages in my voice, and I'm the one who generated that, I'm the one who took advantage of, you know, like Apple's new uh, uh, voice recognition, right, which I'm actually testing out right now as we speak, um, that's my choice. And it's a tool that I have at my disposal now to, to reach out to a broader audience. So... I think that's perfectly cool. There is no reason we can't legitimate, we can't create a legitimate AI marketplace in the service of artists. There's a robust free market for music sampling, synchronization licensing, and deals with new entrants to the digital marketplace, social media companies, and all manner of new technologies. We can do the same thing with AI. Mm -hmm. And my fourth and final point, to cultivate a lawful, responsible AI marketplace, Congress needs to establish rules that ensure creators are respected and protected. One way to do that is to enact a federal right of publicity. Deep fakes and or unauthorized recordings or visuals of artists generated by AI can lead to consumer confusion, unfair competition against the artist that actually was the the, the original creator, market dilution and damage to the artist's reputation, potentially irreparably harming their career. Okay, that's very important too what he's saying right now. It's 
um, when he was talking about dilution, he's talking about the fact that there's so much of it out there, as Brad Colbo had mentioned in his video about make, making or not making money with AI. If there's an overabundance of you out there, the more quantity there is of your stuff out there, if it's just flooding the market, the more that value goes down. Think of it if you're a fine artist, imagine, think for instance, selling a limited edition Giclée print of a painting, a high quality print that's signed and numbered. The, le the reason why artists will sell limited editions is because that increases their value. And as soon as you hit that final one, signed and sealed and delivered, that's it. No more prints are allowed. But if, if AI can just flood the market with stuff that looks like your stuff, your value as an artist diminishes to a point where it becomes completely invaluable. And that's a very important point. An artist's voice is often the most valuable part of their livelihood and public persona. And to steal it, no matter the means, is wrong. A federal right of- Notice, okay, I also want you to pay attention to, as I mentioned before, listen to Jeffrey at one extreme end of the table and compare that to Ben at the opposite end of the table. Notice how it is very easy to follow what Jeffrey's saying. He's not using business talk. He's not using euphemistic language. He's not using uh, ambiguous terms that could mean one thing or another. He's not confusing to listen to. He's being blunt. This is wrong. This is stealing. This is bad. This is good. This is what we do. Something that anybody can follow. Anybody above the age of five can understand him perfectly. That shows his transparency. Publicity would clarify and harmonize the protections currently provided at the state level. Visibility into AI training data is also needed. If the data on AI training is not transparent, then the potential for a healthy marketplace will be stymied as information on infringing content will be largely inaccessible to individual creators. And I might add, based on some of the comments I heard earlier, it would be hard to opt out if you don't know what's been opted in. Finally, AI gen This reflects back on what I was mentioning about Adobe and about the ease of opting out and that opting out should be the default setting. And you, you, it should always be set to off unless you voluntarily turn it on, because then it's up to the, it's up to the developer of this software or this program or whatever it is that they're doing, for them to sell you on the benefits of it. So you can decide for yourself beforehand whether or not it's something that you uh, feel it's worth your time, worth your commitment to, worth your investment, worth the promise. And if that promise is broken, you can pull the plug and pull out. It should be this, this opting in process should not be permanent and it should be very, very easy to understand and it should be at the forefront of anything in big, bold print. And what he's saying right now is very, very important. He's saying, don't hide that opting in or opting out under, under tons of code or legal jargon or this 75 page PDF. No, it should be a button on or off that jumps right in front of your face with the pitch attached to it. This is what you benefit, would you like it or not? That kind of idea. See? So I like what he's saying. content should be labeled as such. We're committed to protecting our artists and the authenticity of their creative works. As you all know, consumers deserve to know exactly what they're getting. I look forward to the discussion this afternoon and I thank you for the opportunity to present my point of view. Thank you. All right, we're gonna stop there for today. It's an excessively long video. Thank you for toughing it out with me, but I think that it's, it's our responsibility as artists and professionals, and it's of course in our best interest to know who's advocating for and against us. How different individuals are, are putting us at the forefront of their priorities and that they're advocating for us, meaning that they're fighting for us, and those who are trying to use sneaky, ambiguous legal jargon and empty, non-committal promises, or not even promises, to try to skirt around ripping you off and stealing your livelihood away from you and benefiting from it by the billions and billions and potentially trillions of dollars that are sitting on this trial and the subsequent trials that are going to follow that I'm going to be covering as well. Okay. So if we're just to give you a bit of a synopsis of what we looked at today, although I kind of went over it multiple times, Ben Brooks, he is in the best interest of, of developing 
this software. He's the representative for Stability AI. He wants to see AI thrive. He's trying to, to position himself in the creative space when he has no creative background whatsoever, him or anybody that works there. These are programmers that are program something that is out of their hands because they don't even have the ability to keep up with it at this point. They let the cat out of the bag and now they're trying to do some damage control by justifying this illegal act. Technically, it's not illegal yet. Hopefully, the Senate Hopefully the Senate does the job and puts some proper safeguards on that. Uh, Dina Rao. Dina Rao, uh, so far so good. I like the fact that Adobe is in on this conversation. I like that he, I find he probably plays one of the most important roles in this. And I'm going to talk about this more in subsequent videos um, because I feel that the leaders in the technology that has led artists for the last several decades, if done properly, should be the ones who serve as the referees or the arbiters of, uh, of this advancement in this technology. I think that Adobe should be calling the shots on the ethics, not Stability AI, because Stability AI has zero stake in artists specifically, Adobe does. If we pull the plug on Adobe, Adobe dies. So artists have the power to dictate the future of Adobe, but we don't have the power to dictate the future of Stability AI. The gray zone for me is Professor Matthew Sag. I want I am I'm, I'm I'm a bit ignorant on this, so you know as far as as far as his stance on this is concerned, I got the impression, although I could be wrong, that he seems to be leaning a little bit more towards the side of artificial intelligence because I think he's personally excited about this. This is the impression that I got. At the beginning, I thought he was advocating for artists, but then at the end, he said, no, you kind of got to let it, you kind of get let the cat out of the bag to train it. And I'm sitting there going, no, you don't. You absolutely don't need to do that at all. So help me to figure that guy out. Pick him apart a little bit and, and see, what, see what comes of that. Uh, Carla Ortiz. I love Carla Ortiz. I've got nothing bad to say about her. And she loves cats, so. <laughs> uh, Carla Ortiz, how do I feel about her testimony? I think she probably had the most, she was the balancing factor in this entire, in this entire conversation. She brought humanity back into this. She brought feeling, she brought vulnerability, she brought emotion, she identified with the fact, she, she brought to the forefront that, that art is an identity, not a job, that this is her life achievement. And she was the only one who smiled and showed pride in her work at the beginning of her testimony where everybody else just said, this is my job and this is what I do and I'm really, really important. Um, and she is, the, she is, she is a, a living example of what can be accomplished with great talent and great dedication in an artistic craft. As for Jeffrey Harleston, I love the fact that he's, he's an equal part Somebody who works with artists every single day, he has more hands-on experience with artists, maybe perhaps a little bit more than Dana Rao because Dana Rao is a little bit more of the business side of things. He does, ha Jeffrey does have a law background, but he's also very much a humanitarian. He's vulnerable. He, he advocates for artists. He has an emotional side to him like Carla. So between Carla and Jeffrey, I think there's a nice balance. Um, I really think moving forward, the, the ones that, are, that I'm the least clear about and the ones I want to find out the most about as far as their stance would be Professor Matthew Sag and Dana Rao. With that said, thank you for sticking it out this long. In the next part, we're going to be looking at the rest of the, uh, some more testimonial from all of these different individuals. I've already made timestamps of all of them so we can skip ahead and not make the video too, too long because there's a lot of material there. And remember that this is a first of a series of of hearings right now. This is just a preliminary hearing, getting the ball rolling, but there's going to be more to come and I'm going to be covering those as well. Stay tuned and I'll see you soon.